Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 5 on Heredity. This is video number 18 and we're going to have a quick review of the structure of proteins in this video. So in this final video of section 3 or inquiry question 3, we're going to investigate the structure and function of proteins in living things. As we've looked at previously, it's important that we have a general understanding of the structure of the protein to link some of the structure of proteins to their function and then perhaps justify the variety of proteins in living things by relating their structure to their function. So as we, as we usually look at um, with our success criteria, uh, a range of uh, simple to more complex levels of understanding and deeper levels of understanding um, so you can expand your knowledge uh, in each of the key areas of the syllabus. So what are proteins? Well, hopefully that's not a question we need to answer anymore uh, because proteins are the phenotypic expression. We've now looked at uh, phenotypes. They're the phenotypic expression of DNA code. We know that they are based on a language of amino acids and we now know that the genetic code, the sequence of bases in DNA, will code for in specific proteins. In fact, the thing about proteins is that we look at a number of different types of aspects of their structure. They are a very simple polymer in one sense. They are a polymer made of a series of amino acids linked together by peptide bonds. And those peptide bonds are what produces the other name for proteins, which is polypeptides. And we tend to regard this as their primary structure. So I've used a little abbreviation here for primary structure. So if we're asked about the primary structure of a protein, we can say these are the amino acids in order. This is what it would look like. Now, the problem is that the proteins uh, don't remain as long, thin chains. They coil. They respond to particularly water. We know that the cytoplasm is a um, high percentage of water in the cytoplasm. So therefore, water is going to interact with the proteins. And what it's going to do is it's going to change the shape of those proteins based on um, the hydrophilic or water-loving regions of the protein and the hydrophobic or water-disliking regions. So the, so the hydrophobic regions are going to try and get away from the water. The hydrophilic regions will be attracted to the water. And this will actually cause a change in the shape of the protein itself. And this happens at a couple of different levels. We've recognized uh, in this secondary structure that there are uh, two kind of main ways in which uh, the protein can start to change in terms of its three-dimensional structure, either to form uh, small spirals, what we call the alpha helix, uh, or more pleated, flat, um, think about, say, the rolled pattern on a roof, um, uh, which is the beta conformation. So we tend to find some of these um, patterns, the spirals or the pleats, in the way that the protein folds. Now, it's not just the fact that there can be interactions between parts of the protein or regions on the amino acids and water. There can also be linkages that can actually form within the proteins itself. Uh, things like sulfur bridges can actually form between different amino acids that can actually change uh, and or strengthen the links between uh, different parts of the protein. Now we're starting to get on to tertiary structures, and we may even... Uh, we may even have uh, what we call a quaternary structure, uh, which is usually associated with, say, multiple proteins all linking together to form a very complex, um, much larger structure, which isn't really a molecule, but it's really more a chemical structure that can uh, facilitate chemical reactions uh, or help to form, say, uh, structural features within the cell or within the organism. So what we want to do in the next slide is just have a little bit of a look at this kind of sequence of uh, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary um, structures in the way that proteins actually fold themselves. 
So you can see the primary uh, protein structure is really like beads on a necklace. So the beads would be the amino acids, and this sequence of amino acids, they all look blue, but in actual fact, there could be 20 different types of uh, these beads to make up this amino acid. And obviously some of them will be repeated more often than others. So that chain of amino acids is what produces our protein. And of course, if we now know the structure of proteins, we know the amino acids, we can actually start working backwards towards the genetic code that may have been responsible for producing that particular protein. Of course, we know that there's some inbuilt redundancy, so this is not a perfect um, process, but it certainly um, is one that we can actually use to kind of engineer in reverse, to, to work back to the genetic code from the structure of the protein. You can see in the secondary um, stage um, that we have these two different types, the spiral arrangement or the pleated arrangement. You can see these two, this is the beta, this is the alpha, uh, and the, the different ways in which these um, proteins can be folded or rolled um, changes based on the nature of the amino acid sequence within each of these different proteins. Now the tertiary structure is the one that's basically this three-dimensional folding pattern. This can happen partly in response to water, but that can also be something that can affect the secondary structure. But it can also be a result of these um, side chain interactions, okay, uh, or what we might also call bridges, ways that the uh, protein can actually link um, from these very long molecules as it starts to coil, um, link to other parts of the protein, which can change the shape, which can create some additional rigidity and structure in the protein, and which can uh, obviously be very important for things like catalyzing particular types of chemical reactions. And I did talk about the fact that we can also get quaternary um, protein structures as well, which usually consist of more than one protein, that, uh, or at least more than one amino acid chain that uh, in link together to form some sort of more complex structure. So what's the function of proteins? What do they do? Well, pr probably really we, we're looking at um, proteins in one of two main categories. These are the two main categories. Proteins tend to be structural or um, functional in terms of biochemistry, so involved in biochemical reactions. And the best example of that is enzymes. So enzymes are very important proteins which are very specific and their very specificity uh, is telling us something about how many we need. Something that is specific means if there's lots of different reactions and sometimes there are multiple enzymes for the same process. And we've seen that in things like DNA replication uh, in protein synthesis itself. So proteins a protein synthesis is about making proteins to help in the process of protein synthesis. So these are some of the important things. But proteins can also act as electron carriers. We've seen them in the uh, when we built the model of the cell membrane in year 11. We saw them as being part of the structure of that cell membrane or um, used um, as channels to help with the movement of materials from one side of the cell, the inside to the outside, or vice versa. Um, proteins are also involved in pigment. Um, Hemoglobin, which carries uh, oxygen around the body, um, nails and hair, all sorts of different things. We also know the specificity. We know that there are uh, regulations or we'll call them regulatory mechanisms. Because the reality is that all of our cells carry the information for all of these proteins. If you think of defense, you're thinking of things like antibodies that are produced. Now, all of our cells can do all of these things, or at least potentially can do all of these things, because they carry the entire genetic code. So one of the really important things about this section is to be able to identify the fact that not all proteins are made by all cells all of the time. There are certain triggers that help the cell know when, where, how often to convert information within the DNA into a specific protein or multiple copies of that protein for particular functions of the cell. So this really brings us to an end of that third section, the third inquiry question for this particular topic on heredity. And it's a nice time to kind of reflect back 
if you use this as a useful study guide, a useful study mechanism to think, okay, inquiry question three was why is polypeptide synthesis important? So an understanding of what polypeptide synthesis is, what does it lead to? What's this word synthesis mean to you? What are polypeptides? What is their role in living organisms? And so therefore, not just why might it be an important process, but why might those particular chemicals be very important for life on Earth? This is a good way, if you sit and do a little bit of free writing, to give yourself a little bit of an understanding of what you've been able to retain from this section and obviously go back to IQ2 and IQ1 and really try and, and focus in on where your knowledge is now, how you're organising that information before we move on to the next section. And we'll do that in future videos. Thanks for watching.